smart buildings will make us safer in the office. And as users increasingly work out of a branch of one, we have what we need to do to support them. Wendy will be joined by Gordon Thompson, the Vice President of EMEA Architecture and Sales Specialists, along with two customers, Corne Mulder from UMC Utrecht and Hartmut Müller from Daimler. Let's check out the session now with Wendy Mars. Hello and welcome to Cisco Live. Thank you for joining us. What a remarkable year it's been since many of us were together in Barcelona last year. It's been a year where we've had to accept what is, where we've had to let go of what was, and where we've had to believe in the future. And as we accept what is, really everything is going digital now. As we let go of what was, some things are not coming back. We've all had to learn to adapt. And as we look forward to the future, we have lots of opportunity, especially for IT. There have been changes that we've wanted to introduce for many years, and they're becoming real now. You play a big and important role in that. The theme for this event is Turn IT Up. And that's exactly what we're all here to do. In this session, we will talk about that change, how we all adapt and how we are digitally transforming. And we're actually going to go into examples of who is doing it well. So we're going to have a deep dive on two examples, one in the automotive section and one in healthcare. But we're also going to talk about what's next, because the pandemic is not the only big trend. There are plenty of new challenges that will be coming our way. We have to not only survive, but thrive during this time. And how do you and we play a big part in what's coming? We have learned two big lessons during this pandemic. We've learned that what can be done digitally must be done digitally. But also this pandemic has produced many heroes. As we think about what can be done digitally, must be done digitally, we see that through many parts of our work, our lives, and our daily existences. We've seen change of weddings going online, and sadly, funerals going online, and many other things. Some of us have picked up new hobbies during this time. You know, a friend of mine decided to become a beekeeper. And when she actually made that decision, of course, she needed to buy a queen bee. She went on the internet. She bought the queen bee. It arrived at her home in a box and it was surrounded by ladies in waiting. Those ladies in waiting are helper bees to support the queen bee through the journey. Who would have ever thought that you could do something like that? We truly are reimagining the possible. Now, do we all want to work from home all the time and never see our colleagues again? Of course we don't. The future of work will be hybrid. But that desire to think differently is something that we need to embrace. It's there and you know, it's exciting. As we think about the pandemic and it's produced many heroes and a lot of those are on the front line and we really do thank those people for that. In addition, the IT community has played an incredibly important role in keeping us all connected and that is all of you. A huge thank you to you. Your role is more is so important, making sure that we keep that connectivity. We are more dependent on technology than we have been before. So you know all eyes really are on you, and we're in this together. This is an opportunity, and it's a big responsibility. It's exciting, and sometimes it can feel a little bit complex. So as we think about this, we need to think about data, and actionable insights from that data. As we connect, we secure and we automate. And as we secure, we block 20 billion threats a day, and that's increasing. Phishing threats have actually jumped by 40% from 2019 to 2020. And that's been driven partly by pandemic related themes. And as we automate and we move from machine to human, we need to keep think about how we drive that, making sure that top of mind always is customer experience, because that's the most important thing. 
By 2023, 14.7 billion machine-to-machine -machine connections will be up and running. Clearly, that's not something that a human can manage alone. Also, we need to think about other themes such as privacy, sovereignty and the green agenda. One good thing that has happened during this pandemic has been the availability of people and the openness to talk and share experiences with each other during this time. I want to introduce you to two people that I've met over the past few months who really have very interesting perspectives to share. First up, we have Hartmut Muller from Daimler. Hi Hartmut, great to see you. Hi Wendy, thanks for having me, it's a pleasure. So Hartmut, I've got a, some, some really interesting questions for, for us to go through in the next uh, five minutes or so. So tell us about how you think about the customer driving experience, all of the data that that brings you, and how that data shapes the experience that you can provide. Uh, good question, Wendy. When I'm thinking about that, I'm really thinking about a connected car. And a connected car for me, technology, technology speaking, is a little data center on wheels, mm. so to say. And that when we are talking about our car fleet and also about our environment, we are primarily talking about a distributed edge cloud, which is connected. So that means we use the data from the driver, from the car, also from the environment, uh, and also from our data centers and machinery parks in the production plants to really improve the car production on the one side, the driver experience with complete new features over the life cycle of a car, but also the after sales and maintenance. So overall, a huge ad cloud, which is connected and the data we can use uh, for the good of the customer. Fantastic. And how do you think about data privacy and security? And is that actually part of customers' buying criteria now? I think, uh, let me start with security, because I think looking on a 10 years time span on security, in the past it was a function. Mm. In the future, I think it will be a key decision criteria. Today we are talking left shifting security and converging security with multiple layers. I primarily think that we see a huge convergence between cloud, IoT, mobility, and security, and it will definitely be a decision criteria. Privacy we follow, especially GDPR mm -hmm. and data sovereignty we follow as well, uh, following the European initiatives, for instance, GaiaX or CatenaX, and also being a member of the IDSA, that means the International Data Space Association, which supports all that in terms of uh, privacy. Okay. And are there actually any data sovereignty implications? So you're a global organization and your customers sit all over the globe. How do you deal with that? I think uh, important from that perspective is really what I mentioned in the question before, that we are supporting the initiatives of data sovereignty. And I think looking on how that will be built in a very decentralized way, it is uh, important that data resides on premise on the customer side and the data uh, owner, the customer, can at the end decide whether he provides his data for usage or not. And that's independent from that perspective, whether you are dealing with business in China, Asia, Europe, or the United States, for instance. So that means our principles regarding that and also our integrity code is reflecting that heavily towards our customers worldwide. Okay, and something that's very top of mind for us all now is sustainability and green. How are you thinking about those environmental requirements as well? Regarding sustainability, we have our roadmap ambition 2039. And I think it's very important that when we look into that, it's not about having the entire fleet CO2 neutral until 2039. It's really about also dealing with our value chain, for instance, with our suppliers on the one side. It's also dealing with the production chain, uh, how we are producing, and especially also when I'm looking from an IT perspective on it, it's really about how are we dealing with our data centers. We have to be CO2 neutral, for instance, from a data center perspective until 2025. And that also includes, for instance, all the suppliers in here. So that means it's a huge topic 
for us as a company. Also, our fleet is changing. When you look to the new products and the new cars, which are coming out, completely different, supporting that initiative heavily. Thank you, Hartmann. It's really, really interesting to just see how you're thinking about some of these different topics and bringing that into the way that you're engaging and you're operating and, excitingly, how you're using technology in order to be, be able to solve to some of these things. Thanks, Wendy. It was a pleasure. Fantastic. Thank you. Wasn't that fantastic to hear some of the different dynamics within the automotive sector? And actually, that your car is a data center on wheels. Now we're going to transition to an entirely different sector, that of healthcare, where we're going to meet Corne. Corne, great to see you. You're welcome. So Corne, health is an area of major digital transformation. What changes do you expect to keep? In the uh, last year, you can imagine that in healthcare with this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, this was a real change that, that we had. Um, if you look at, for example, our patients, um, they were always coming physically to the hospital. Uh, but in last year, of course, with uh, their vulnerability, they didn't want to come to the hospital and we didn't allow them to come to the hospital. But then we saw that with video conferencing that we only had three pre-COVID, three per month. All of a sudden, we had like 2,000 in a month and it worked perfectly. Our doctors and our patients experienced that this was the, just like we did. This worked perfectly. You don't have to come physically to the hospital. So this, I think, something that we will certainly keep for a lot of uh, things that we can perfectly do this on a distance. Fantastic. And, you know, how are you bringing together experts from around the world as you think about specialist treatments? Yeah. Also there, COVID has really drastically uh, increased the speed and the way of working together. Um, you've seen it's never shown that we can work together around the globe, investigating a disease and creating a vaccine so fast. And of course, there was a cooperation between all the pharmaceutical industry and, of course, all the knowledgeable people from our academic hospitals around the globe. Um, and what we also did is we created an environment, we were working already on an IT environment, creating the cooperation possibilities with all these people who could bring the data together, then do all the calculations and investigate and bring all those data easy together in a safe way. And that really helped the fact that we had this environment ready and the, pen and, and the COVID-19 coming together. That fit perfectly. That's great to hear. And one of the things we're all battling with, of course, is the future of work. How do you think about that with your team? Yeah. Also, in, 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 uh, if people think about a hospital or our researchers, then everybody thinks that at a hospital, you need to physically be there. Mm. Um, but we, we've seen uh, a couple of years ago already that 46% of what we do in hospital could perfectly be done from home or from a distance. Education, research, perfectly doable from a distance and working together by video call or by uh, uh, other kinds of environments. Uh, but even with patients from a distance, as 46% of our patients can work uh, from a distance, we can do that from home. Um, so this, this is really, uh, I think, important to see that that is something that we can keep over time. And Corne, if we think about with technology, you can do new things, which is fantastic. But also there's an element of people and driving change with people. How have you worked with that within your, your um, in, within the hospital? Yeah, um, if, if you look like healthcare, by nature, we are not the fast moving and fast changing environment. Uh, we are typically, it needs to be safe. It needs to follow all the rules because you don't want any risk with your life or with your health. But typically uh, what you saw now is with this, uh, this COVID that we could, like the example I gave, we could work together being much faster if we focus together. 
Um, and then we've we've had the investigate we have meetings with our senior management and our doctors together when we were all happy with changing so fast and being able with this pressure cooker to work so fast and make this big change immediately. And that is something everybody says, can we please keep waking, keep working this way rather than the old fashioned way? Mm. Fantastic. I think this was great. That's that's great to hear. And you know, we truly are reimagining the possible together. So thank you, Corne. I'd like to say a big thank you to both of our guests today for their really fantastic insight. And now we're going to transition to a colleague of mine at Cisco, Gordon Thompson. Welcome, Gordon. Good to see you, Wendy. Delighted to be with you. You too. So, Gordon, we're both technologists at heart, and I'm excited about what the future holds. Yeah, me too. Very passionate about how technology is going to have an impact, Wendy. But times have been difficult recently. Lockdown has been hard. Sometimes I, I dream of my happy place. Um, I'm sure you do and many others do too. Mine is St Andrews in Scotland, a small town with beautiful coastline, fantastic golf, and a welcoming town that offers great friendship. You know, I'm desperate for the simple things in life. I'm desperate to have choice again. So as we exit the pandemic and we get our lives back to normal, IT will be the great enabler for choice. Choice both in our personal lives, but also in our corporate lives too. As we innovate for the future, we at Cisco want to make sure our technology helps IT decision makers contribute in a positive way to employees' lives, organisational health and the planet. So let me share some examples of how Cisco is going to do that in all three areas. First, let's look at people and their well-being. Cisco is investing heavily on high-speed connectivity. You'll see that with our optics investment, our 5G and Wi-Fi 6 developments. High-speed access is critical in this new world for employees to be productive. But high-speed access will now also allow us to monitor the well-being of our employees too on a real-time basis. When you connect sensors to cloud apps via high-speed networks, we open up a whole new world of possibilities. In the high contact sport of rugby, they are trialling the use of a mouth guard that can monitor if a player has been concussed while on the field of play. Small sensor embedded in the mouth guard connected to a Wi-Fi 6 network and off to the cloud, providing immediate results back on the health of that player. This can be true for our employees' health too, as more and more work from home. Sensors can monitor stress levels and other vitals to make sure that our employees are safe and well while working remotely. Cisco is now building sensor technology into our collaboration products so that when you deploy them at home, we can monitor screen time, we can monitor ambient temperature and lighting to make sure that our employees are safe while working. We're not just building products to offer great collaboration experiences, we're embedding technology to help our employers care for their employees too. Indeed, it might not be long before we have a legal obligation to care for those workers we're asking to work at home in the same way as we have a legal obligation when workers come in to the office. So Cisco is committed to continue to innovate inside our products to make sure that our company can best serve the needs of our employees. Secondly, let's talk about organisational evolution. Now, we think hybrid work, and every time we say hybrid now, I can feel the fatigue from all of you already. But hybrid can be great. Merging physical and virtual together along with hardware and software, can make magical experiences if you get it right. I want you to think about sport again. I want you to think about being in a stadium watching a live event. But this time, watch it also on your phone so you can zoom in in real time to see what's happening on the field or indeed replay instantaneously that penalty decision that's just gone against your team. This is when we can make great experiences of build, bringing physical and virtual together. When your workers are working from home, don't just think secure connectivity, think experience. 
by using the best in class Cisco hardware, we can really make interactions truly amazing. Working on documents real time, uh, language translation instantaneously, facial recognition, all of these things come together on one piece of Cisco hardware with phenomenal software innovation, the Cisco Desk Pro series. But it's actually going beyond collaboration now as well. The person working from home is now the branch of one. Have you heard that term, the branch of one? And IT organizations are having to bundle together multiple services to deliver the branch of one. At Cisco, we are bundling multiple capabilities together to allow you to consume them easily with our new as-a-service type capabilities, Cisco Plus. And this is going to help you deliver more flexibility for your users as they're working from home. Finally, in this area, it's important that we deliver a world-class application experience. And the way we're doing that is by making sure you have end-to-end -end visibility, no matter where your users are connecting to any cloud. And we do that by merging together the technologies from AppD and a thousand eyes to make sure that we never compromise your experience. Finally, let's talk about the planet. This decade is definitely going to be the decade where we don't just talk about carbon neutrality, we act on carbon neutrality. And the IT department has to step up and play a much bigger role here. You've heard our chief executive talk about this earlier on today, and every chief executive is thinking about carbon neutrality and is thinking about sustainability. How is their business going to impact the world for the better? Well, I've got a small secret to tell you. The Ethernet cable is going to help you. Yes, the basic Ethernet cable is definitely going to help you here. As you build out your building strategies, you're maybe thinking of closing some down. You're thinking about those buildings that fundamentally are going to play a key part in your business moving forward. Well, I say to you, every single one of those buildings needs to be a smart building. Smart is where the Ethernet cable can look after things like heating and lighting, security, CCTV. Bringing them all together on one Ethernet cable is delivered through the innovation of Cisco's Catalyst switching portfolio. This allows us to reduce electrical components by up to 30% in your building and reduce your energy consumption by 20%. One great way for you to go on a carbon neutral journey is to realize you can change the inefficiencies of your building strategies by building smart buildings. So in closing, Cisco believes totally that we can deliver choice for the better, for all as we move forward and we are committed to innovate in our products to deliver that. Choice that will allow you to connect, to secure, and to drive scalability and automation at levels you've never thought of before. Cisco's here to make the world greener, safer, and more agile in this decade. Back to you, Wendy. Thank you, Gordon. So it's clear, innovation and technology continues to be incredibly exciting. The opportunity from technology is greater than ever before. But that's just one part of many things that we need to juggle. We need to make sure that we maintain a focus on digital skills and also keep reimagining the possible with the different opportunities that technology brings. So let's turn IT up together. Thank you and please enjoy the rest of Cisco Live. Thank you to Wendy, Gordon, and our customers for joining that session just now. Um, great to hear her perspective on our region. And I really liked what Hartmut Miller from Daimler said, a connected car is a data center on wheels. Such an interesting insight. I also enjoyed Gordon's example of the connected mouth guards, a fascinating use case, which is enabled by Wi-Fi 6. Alper, what did you think of the last session? Well, a few things especially stood out to me. And firstly, that is you, our attendees, our IT heroes. You know, the IT community has played such an important role in keeping everybody connected. That's all of you out there. So, you know, well done. And also, you know, Gordon spoke a bit about lockdown and how hard that has been and how great it would be to have a choice again. And IT can enable that. 
So moving on, speed, agility, and flexibility are more important than ever. Teams need to connect users and devices anytime. Next, we're going to be hearing from G. Rittenhouse and James Mobley on Network as a Service, your on-ramp to the cloud, Secure Access Service Edge, or as we call it, SASE. It's going to be a great session and really, really looking forward to hearing more from G and James on this topic. Do make sure you um, share your thoughts on the session and tweet us using hashtag Cisco Live, tag us at Cisco Live Europe. And without further ado, we will go over and listen to G and James talk about SASE. Enjoy the session. Welcome again to Cisco Live. Uh, this is uh, an opportunity for us to have a good time with you and to take you a little bit deeper uh, in this innovation talk. This is SASE as well as Network as a Service. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the keynote. Uh, we are very excited about taking you through this session today. I'm James, I am here with G, and um, uh, we've had some exciting times. So 2021, we're extremely excited about as well. Uh, as you all know, uh, 2020 took an impact on us all around the world. In some ways, it impacted us personally, and then also, G, it also impacted us from a business perspective as well. Yeah, thanks, James. Wow, what a difference a year makes. Overnight, entire industries had to switch to remote work. And now the network is not just the WAN, but the internet. And so latency, security, visibility are all essential for business connectivity to applications. In this environment, traditional networking and security are even more complex. And uh, James, I'm so excited to be with you to outline Cisco's strategy for our secure access service edge and network as a service in today's presentation. Thank you, G. And uh, you mentioned the network transformation. So let's take a little closer look at some of the evolution that's taking place within the network. When you think about the fact that we were all sitting in the campuses and branches uh, around the globe, you know, the network was very different, but very traditional based on our experiences over the last uh, decade plus. And uh, one of the things that we see is we see this uh, tendency to go site to site. You also see the core things at the center of today's or yesterday's networks, if you will, that were anchored around MPLS transport, core routing services, perimeter security. But when you look to the right, you begin to look at the right side uh, of this particular uh, diagram here, you will see that the networks have in fact changed. We're all working remotely. We're all over the place and that is creating quite an interesting uh, dynamic where the internet basically becomes a network. And so you begin to see a need for users to get to applications from anywhere at any time. That also begins to see a few other things begin to rise up to the top like cloud on-ramp and SD-WAN and IP overlays and even application SLAs, uh, which are, you know, again, things that are just prominent in this internet centric world. But one of the things that's also at the center of that is the internet and cloud. And when the cloud becomes at the center of things and the internet becomes at the center of things, you will see requirements begin to bubble up. And one of those requirements is around security and in particular architecture as well. And so with that in mind, I'd love for you now to maybe take over and let's take everyone through SASE and what that means and the impact of this environment on that. Thanks, James. With applications moving into the cloud and users logging in from anywhere, our customers are telling us that the biggest problem they face is how to securely connect these together. Our solution is to move your secure WAN to the cloud edge. This is being referred to as Secure Access Service Edge, or SASE. SASE brings together security, networking, and visibility into one place instead of siloed point solutions you've experienced historically. We are integrating these capabilities into one single integrated service cloud. By doing this, we'll be able to better solve the problems that you face today. We can lower costs with higher productivity. We can radically simplify your operations, allowing you to focus on the high value objectives, the business objectives you have, and truly leverage your cloud migration. 
we can also better collaborate between the NetOps folks and the security operations teams with more co uh, operational consistency, producing faster time to value. And finally, improving your network and security with complete end-to-end -end visibility and control. For more than three decades, Cisco has created the market leading network technologies that you all depend on for over a decade. We have brought you cloud native security services. And for the first time, we're bringing these core building blocks together. And even more recently, we bring in zero trust and end to end visibility. Now we are making it easier than ever with our new SASE bundle that allows you to transition to a single subscri subscription service in the future. We recognize that everyone is at a unique point in their SASE journey, and we can bridge your solution to uh, wherever you are in your journey. Whether you're looking to on-ramp traffic into the cloud, securely connect remote workers, or security from on-prem into the cloud, we can help. So let's see how this works. We're taking the entire WAN and security stacks together, providing a single cloud edge, enabling you to deliver seamless, secure access to any application on any user's network. By moving the secure WAN into the cloud, and not just a few features here and there, we're able to increase the performance. We can dynamically select the best path across the SD-WAN fabric, including providing high quality of service, optimizing SaaS applications, driving efficiency in the middle mile, and more. And the security side, we've already brought together firewalls, secure web gateways, DNS security, and CASB in Cisco Umbrella. And now at Cisco Live, we're announcing the availability of data loss protection and remote browser isolation. And we'll be expanding to include workload security. JT Clay, one of our technical marketing engineers, is going to walk us through a quick demo of how easy it is to get up and running with Meraki and Umbrella integrated together. Thank you so much, G, and hello, everyone. We're going to give you a sneak peek at what we're working on for Cloud OnRamp to extend your Meraki SD-WAN auto VPN to Umbrella SIG in the Meraki dashboard. This is using the Umbrella SIG connector. Our remote sites have already been configured as VPN spokes, so we're ready to start the OnRamp process. Here you can see we're at the Cloud OnRamp screen, and this is found by navigating to the Umbrella SD-WAN connector under your organization settings. Once there, we'll click the Connect Umbrella SIG, and we're presented with a form where we will input our Umbrella API key, secret, and organization. Once we've filled out this form, we can then click Submit, and we'll see that the button changes from Connect to Deploy Umbrella SIG. Once we've clicked the Deploy button, we'll then need to supply a name for our connector. Here, we're going to use the name SIGUS. And then we'll select our both our primary and our secondary data center, here selecting Los Angeles and New York, for example. Optionally, we can select to deploy the connector as a hub in all of our sites configured as auto VPN spokes. If left unchecked, we'll just need to deploy these later on. We can then click Submit. Once we've clicked Submit, we can navigate to our Deployment tab, where we can see our primary and secondary data center, LAX and New York City. We can then navigate to our organizational overview page where we'll see two new networks that have names that correspond to the two umbrella data centers that we have selected. From there, we can look at our umbrella dashboard and navigate to our network tunnels and we'll see two new tunnels that have been created with names that correspond to the serial number of the connectors that we have deployed in the Meraki dashboard. Now that we've deployed these tunnels, we can now apply a policy to the tunnel and start securing this tunnel traffic. Back to you, G. Thanks, JT. That is amazing. No other vendor offers the breadth of assets and the expertise across networking and security for both on-prem and in the cloud. 
With Talos Intelligence, we provide the industry's most comprehensive threat prevention in real time, giving you market leading protection. And we're building a service that securely connects users, networks, applications, all together, everything in between. No matter where you are in your cloud journey, we enable you to evolve your architecture at your own pace. We ensure that your investments are future-proof, but we're not stopping at SASE. To talk about that, James is coming back right after this short video. In today's world, your way is the way. Now, you can get that same simplicity and flexibility across your business as a service. We're transforming how you consume and use technology with an ecosystem that's designed around your needs. That's IT your way, an unparalleled experience that ensures your business runs as you intended. That's Cisco Plus, simplified IT your way. Hopefully you are energized by that uh, video. Um, I am so excited to announce Cisco Plus. Uh, Cisco Plus is the brand for Cisco and Partner Certified as a service offers. It gives us an opportunity to be able to take products and move those products into complete solutions to deliver really specific outcomes and unparalleled experiences. Uh, the Cisco Plus brand is just an extension of the world-class brand, which is Cisco, that you helped us to create. And then it's Cisco Plus, and that plus are all the capabilities that we will in, in envelope underneath the Cisco Plus brand. So we're gonna anchor um, with the brand in three areas, and this is something that you will see as we roll offers out that fit underneath the Cisco Plus family. We're gonna anchor around simple. You know, you've asked us to kind of simplify the way that you do business with us, simplify the experience when you're on our platforms and our offers. And so we're going to significantly simplify that and make sure that that experience is one that will bring you back time and time again. Also predictable. We want to make sure that uh, the outcomes that we deliver are going to be predictable every time. We're going to ensure that uh, you can trust in us to be able to deliver the service level objectives uh, that you desire and give you that level of predictability. Also intelligence. One of the things that we pride ourselves on is being able to take lots of data and insights and then to use that insight to help our customers make the right decisions, whether those are buying decisions or whether those are operational decisions to make the adjustments necessary to achieve the value that you desire. And so that intelligence will also be another one of the key anchor points uh, within the Cisco Plus brand. It will also give us the ability over time to make sure that the experience you see gets richer and richer as we get more and more insight. Uh, it will also be uh, a, a plan or a brand where we can uh, ensure that you can consume very flexibly. Uh, you'll be able to buy all these offers as a subscription, flexibly consumed. And then finally, again, as we mentioned up front, this will be extensible to our partners because again, we understand the value that our partners provide for us. We wanna make sure we create the right lanes of value for our partners. So as we think about uh, Cisco Plus and now the offer around network as a service, uh, we will have a number of our offers that will fall under the Cisco Plus umbrella. Network as a service, as it evolves and as it comes to market will be a Cisco Plus uh, offer. Uh, we wanna try to make sure that with network as a service that we not only leverage you know, our, our leading networking capability, but also we wanna make sure that we leverage the security strength that you heard G talk about. And then of course, we're gonna also talk a little bit more about visibility. Those we believe give us the combination that will allow you to receive and achieve the outcomes that you desire. There are a few things we wanna make sure we also cover. And that is one of those is around optimized application experiences. Oftentimes, how we feel when we go online has all to do with the application experience and our ability around traffic management and routing, our ability around visibility and assurance. 
will ensure that the application experience is going to be the best that you could possibly have. Also, security and visibility. When we talk about what makes for that trusted uh, environment, those trusted offers, security will be paramount. You heard G talk a lot about that. Visibility is another area that we have a leading portfolio powered by Thousand Eyes, and you will hear more about uh, that as we kind of move into a little bit of a deeper look. But we believe that networking, security, and visibility give us a leading solutions uh, in the network as a service space that you can leverage to get all the outcomes you deserve. Also, future-proof investment. One of the things that you've always asked us to do is to make sure that if you make investments, you've got the right bridge forward. You heard G mention this as well. But we will ensure that if you buy a, a SASE bundle today, that you will have a very favorable treatment bridging you into the future network as a service offer as well. We want to make sure that we continue to protect your investment. What I would like to do now is maybe go to the, the next one and let's take a little bit of a deeper look. Uh, this is the architecture um, slide that G had also talked about. He focused a lot on the left-hand side, which is security. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the right-hand side here, which is our core strength in networking. And then I want to zero in a little bit on the network as a service platform, because this is going to be key to how we differentiate and going to be key to how we rapidly move through our portfolio of offers and deliver you a continuous um, stream of value. Um, so the platform itself is going to have some key capabilities. And what's uh, what's cool about this is that it will give us the ability to build these capabilities once. And then when we bring new technologies and new capabilities into the portfolio, then these will already be there. and They'll simply be extensible throughout the new capabilities. So what does that mean? That means that the speed at which we will be able to build offers on top of the platform are going to be unmatched. And that, that is going to be key. It also means that we take a lot of our leading innovations and we move that into the network as a service platform. So we're going to have API extensibility, which will create you know, lots of lanes of value for partners and also for other technologies that we want to incorporate into the platform. This policy engine that means that we will have the ability to automatically distribute policy, you know, cross domain across the full fabric as we need. And that's going to be something that will also simplify significantly your operational, uh, your operational challenges. Uh, the global cloud on ramps is going to be technology that will allow us You heard G talk about this. But one of the key things is how do we get any user to any app, to any cloud, anywhere at any time, and having the ability with all of our world-class uh, networking, traffic management uh, technologies, we'll be able to truly leverage this global on-ramp capability from the platform, and that'll be extensible as well. In the area of ML and AI, this is an area we've done a lot of work in. Uh, we're going to talk about how that kind of plays hand in hand with our observability as well. But one of the things we're going to do is we're going to continue to evolve. And later you will see some predictive technology that continue to elevate the experience that you're going to have with the NAS platform. Um, we also have health monitoring. Really key in cloud environments is to be able to have that uh, always on ability to monitor the health and to assure that everything is functioning as it has been designed. Observability, this is something that we really believe in and we believe that it is a must have. If you're going to have a SASE architecture network as a service platform, you must have observability. We're very pleased and fortunate to have Thousand Eyes be a key part of our portfolio, and it will be one of the key technologies that you will see in our network as a service platform. And then finally, we also have here the self-serve portal. We know that uh, everyone has different ways that they want to experience the platform and our offers, and one of those is through a self-service a portal and that capability will also be made available, you know, through the cloud platform. And that will be certainly something that not only our customers, but also our partners can take advantage of. And so this is kind of a look beneath the service, if you will, at the architecture level. And one of the things I would love to you to be able to see now is a more simplistic view of what this really looks like through a demonstration. And I would like to ask uh, Yardin Harev, who is one of our technical marketing engineers, 
to come and to give you a sense of not only the simplicity of, of what the offer could look like as we evolve it and we deliver it down the road, but also the power in the simplicity. And so with that, I want to turn it over to you, Arden. Thank you, James. With the Cisco WAN as a service, we will interconnect any user to any application. That user could be working from home, working from the branch, or they could be on the road. We'll be able to connect them to any application. That could be a private application or a SaaS application. It's built on top of the Cisco Cloud, which is a network of global points of presence that was built and is optimized to carry customer traffic in a secure way that is powered by Cisco Umbrella Security. All of that is served in a single unified subscription, allowing customers to scale up and scale down as they need in a very flexible way. With the Cisco Secure WAN as a service, we not only interconnect all those different entities to each other, but we also give you a very simplified single pane view into everything that's connected to your network, whether those are remote users working from home, sites, either Meraki or Viptela, web traffic and private or public apps, together with the broader view of the uptime of the Cisco cloud and the amount of threats that were blocked by our service. With the Cisco Secure Win as a service, we also want to give you simplified management of your network across your user sites and applications. And this is really the goal in this overview page here. We really care about you seeing how well are your users connected to applications and whether that is seeing how many users are online, what is the state of connectivity of your sites, how many threats were blocked, or how well your applications are performing. You'll be able to see all you need in this page with a very simple drill down into the things that you care about as an administrator. So as I go to the policy page here on top of the screen, I can very easily see what policies are applied and which identities they are applied to. So I can apply the same policy to Viptela sites, to Meraki sites, and to remote users in a single click. I hope this helps you understand how the Cisco Secure WAN as a service could help you in the future. So stay tuned for more details. And James, back to you. Thank you, Yardin. I really appreciate you going through that. And hopefully that gave you a sense of the, not only the simplicity, but also the power of looking at those use cases. You know, use cases where you begin to see the flexibility of the connectivity. You begin to see that uh, holistic uh, policy uh, distribution as well around policy management. And so hopefully that was perfect for letting you know that even though there's a lot of value and technology beneath the surface, we've got a really smooth, simple, predictable, intelligent platform that you'll be able to experience. And so now this kind of brings us to the end of, of our journey here, hopefully through the, the lens that G presented, uh, on SASE, walking us through the SASE journey. What I've presented to you around network as a service, giving you the opportunity to see where we're going and what we're gonna be delivering to you down the road. You've got a chance to see and experience what the power of networking, security, and observability is going to mean. And you also got a chance to see the Cisco Plus uh, brand for our as a service offers, which is gonna deliver a trusted uh, degree of outcomes and experiences for you. I know your journey in Cisco Live is not over, but what we want to make sure you do is you see on the screen here are some resources that you can also click to get more insights around SASE and Cisco Plus brand. And then you also have some other sessions that we would love for you to be able to check out to give you more insight on networking, more insight also on our observability uh, offers. So with that, I want to just thank you again for the trust you placed in Cisco. We thank you so much for attending uh, this session and for attending Cisco Live. And we hope that the rest of your Cisco Live journey is a great one. Thank you. Thank you to James and G for that fantastic session. It's very clear that things around us have absolutely changed. And now it's a users connecting directly to applications securely in the cloud. So our SASE bundle brings together Cisco's cloud security and connectivity, of connectivity offerings as a single, simple, flexible platform as part of Cisco Plus. Everything that you love about Cisco Plus. If you do want to learn more about SASE, check out the security booth in the world of solutions. Chat with our experts, ask all your questions there. And Alpa, in the world of solutions, you were telling me about the gateway the other day. What is that exactly? 
Absolutely, David. Now, let me tell you, this is a really special opportunity for you to have a direct gateway into Cisco. So the Gateway is a community that's designed for you, our customers. We've got 20,000 members worldwide, and they're all passionate about Cisco and our technology. Big shout out to all those Gateway members. As a Gateway member, you can build really powerful connections within the community. You can exchange best practices with other top experts in your industry, and you have a direct gateway into Cisco product news and insights. You can enjoy the excitement of Cisco Live 365 days of the year. So talking about excitement, we're taking a dance party break thanks to Intel. Get up and get moving. Somewhere out there, some really smart people are having a great conversation about the very latest. The latest analytics tools, the latest breakthrough in AI and machine learning, and you want to listen in? Cisco Champion Radio, a podcast by technologists for technologists. Today's campus environments rely on an ever-complex web of digital services reaching across the global internet. Every day, users access externally hosted applications, cloud services, and multiple ISPs over hundreds of networks. But with no visibility over these networks and applications, it can take hours or even days to locate and fix problems. Problems that directly impact your service outcomes. Ensuring service delivery on campus requires visibility off campus, end to end, from switch to SaaS and everything in between. That visibility has arrived. Introducing Thousand Eyes Service Assurance for Catalyst 9000, now part of your DNA software subscription for new and existing Catalyst 9K customers. With Thousand Eyes, you can see every network hop across the internet to SaaS applications, your data center, and cloud-based services. Thousand Eyes vantage points are now included on your Catalyst 9000, so you can quickly and easily start seeing beyond your own network. With comprehensive insight across service providers, you can pinpoint issues fast and fix them, or escalate them to the right party. So you can deliver the experience your users expect and your business depends on. The industry's best enterprise switch now has the industry's best SaaS service assurance solution. Thousand Eyes and Catalyst 9000. Your view of the network just got a whole lot bigger. All right, here we go. It's another dance set. This one, it's sponsored by Intel. Let's go. Let's have some fun. Let's turn it up. It's DJ Nick hanging out with you guys. Let's have some fun. can have a little bit of fun while you're at home, right? So get up, wave your hands back and forth. Nobody's watching you. I know I've done it with you guys in Vegas. So I know that now on a global stage, virtually, we can all do it together. Let's have some fun. Let's enjoy ourselves. Cisco Live 2021, that is what it's all about. It's about bringing everyone together, even if it is globally and virtually this year. Let's have some fun. Now here's a good build up. Here's a good build up. One, two, three, let's go. All right, only 30 more seconds in the still dance break. Come on, let's go. Once again, a huge shout out to our sponsor of this dance break, Intel. Thank you so much. Everybody, hope you're having fun. Cisco Live 2021. My heart rate's going now. 
Thank you guys. We'll see you guys. Let's have some fun. This DJ Nick. Come on. Thanks to our sponsor, Intel, for that awesome dance party with DJ Nick. I know I was jamming along, and how good were that gorilla and that T-Rex? Now, we've heard a lot today about how the internet has given people unprecedented access to information and opportunity, but access to the internet is not equal. This is what we call the digital divide. Next up, we have the leaders taking internet access to the next level. Let's take some time to reimagine the internet for the future 2.0. In 2019, we introduced the internet for the future, and today we build on that innovation, uh, on that foundation with more groundbreaking innovations in silicon, optics, software, and systems. Let's check it out. I want to create stories that take people through new worlds like a roller coaster. Filmmaking is a creative medium that uses a lot of moving parts. And the faster technology gets, the better it is for a creative person. It's building and it's growing and it's growing faster. And I see that happening with Cisco. Between the film industry as it is and the film industry as it will be, there's a bridge. Cisco, the bridge to possible. The digital divide is real. In fact, there are over 3 billion people around the entire world that have either no connectivity or underserved, which means they have less connectivity than they need. The real question for all of us is how do we enable to connect the next billion users around this planet? Well, we at Cisco believe that this can be done through innovation and dramatically lowering the cost of both buying and procuring equipment, but also being able to manage operationally that equipment as well. Back in December of 2019, 15 months ago, we actually launched Internet for the Future, where we talked about innovations in silicon systems and optics. And less than 15 months later, we have a whole new set of innovations to talk to you about today. We have, since then, nine new additional pieces of silicon to add to our Silicon One portfolio, which brings the total to 10. We also have completed our Acacia acquisition, which brings in a whole new set of digital coherent optics, as well as the future of how networks will be built that we are calling routed optical networks. So with that, what I'd like to do is hand it over to my friend and partner, Bill Gartner, to talk about all the innovations that are happening and how you're gonna fundamentally change how networks are built for the future for the internet. Thanks, Jonathan, and I'm delighted to be here today. I wanna to tell you a little bit about what's happening with routed optical uh, solutions, routed optical networking, and some of the innovation that's going into that. Traditionally, networks have been deployed with at least two and sometimes three distinct layers, an IP layer for packet services, an OTN layer for private line and OTN services, and an optical layer that really efficiently manages the capacity on the fiber. But that also included rotums that were used to bypass routers that were considered to be the most precious resource in the network. There were good economic reasons for doing this 10 years ago but it led to significant complexity with separate control planes, separate data planes, separate planning and operations, and separate product life cycles. This multi-layer architecture led to really significant operations complexity with separate management solutions for the IP domain, separate management solutions for the optical and OTN domain, and no way to really optimize things between those layers. Now, as we look at the network economics, what we know is that the interconnect of those layers is where there's significant cost. That optics interconnect is something that we have to figure out either how to reduce the cost or change the architecture to eliminate that cost. In 2019, Cisco acquired Luxterra, and Luxterra has developed an industry-leading silicon photonics platform. They really delivered on the promise of silicon photonics, which is to leverage the semiconductor industry and its manufacturing processes to achieve scale in the manufacturing of short reach optics that are used in data center and telco applications. More recently, we were thrilled to close the acquisition of Acacia. Acacia's coherent portfolio has applications outside the data center in things like Metro, long haul and subsea applications. But one of the key innovations that Acacia brings is in delivering coherent pluggables that replace the need for chassis based transponders in many applications. This enables a massive architectural simplification. 
Additionally, these pluggables allow us to capitalize on some recent trends towards open systems. Historically, optical systems were closed, but Cisco is strongly supportive of industry consortiums like TIP and Open Rotom, which are driving disaggregation and open solutions. These provide customers with increased choice and eliminate the fear of, of vendor lock-in. As we look to simplify networks and eliminate layers, just look at the chain of products that are required to get a signal from a router into the fiber today. A router port has a short reach optic that connects to a fiber jumper that connects to a short reach optic that is part of a transponder sitting in a chassis that then has a long reach optic that finally connects to a rotom that delivers the signal onto the fiber. As we delayer the network and leverage some of the newer routing and optics technologies, we can eliminate many of these interconnects, simplifying operations and significantly reducing cost, space, and power. The future is much simpler, leveraging high capacity router ports and ZR and ZR plus pluggables, DWDM optics, and the economic benefits are real. CapEx savings arise from the elimination of discrete optics and systems, and OpEx savings arise from reduced power and space and overall simplification of operations. We'd be happy to engage you directly to see how you might be able to take advantage of some of these innovations to drive benefits in your network. Now, Kevin is going to speak about innovation in mass scale routing. Thanks, Bill. To take advantage of routed optical networking, we've had to revamp our entire mass scale portfolio. So whether it's the NCS portfolio in access and aggregation, the ASR 9K in the edge, or the Cisco 8000 in the core, we've rebuilt the entire portfolio to enable ZR and ZR plus optics. Uh, and we leverage iOS XR from end to end to enable us to deliver seamless services across this network. Uh, we enable protocols like segment routing and eVPN to really enhance the services that our customers can offer. Segment routing has been around for almost a decade now, uh, and we're enhancing and enriching that network stack, allowing our customers to do things like advanced performance monitoring across the routed optical network, uh, circuit style segment routing policies, uh, and even point to multi point technologies to enable services to run across uh, segment routing that could never run before. Then we can enable services with eVPN, enabling better service resiliency uh, and point to multi point service delivery with technologies like eTree. Once we build that network infrastructure, we have to automate it. And so our focus is to deliver visibility, action, and insights across the network in an inherently software-defined and autonomous infrastructure. We leverage cloud-enhanced technologies to scale, uh, and we can deliver across multi-vendors and across multi-domains. Uh, and then lastly, we have to make sure that whatever we deliver is scalable and adaptive to whatever our customers need. Back to you, Jonathan. Thank you, Kevin and Bill, for just a phenomenal tour through all the great innovations that the team has been coming up with around silicon systems, optics, and software. I could not be more excited about the transition of network architectures, the, really the first major transition in over 30 years. So let's now hear directly from our customers on their thoughts on routed optical networks. So when we talk about mass scale infrastructure, Microsoft is building some of the largest networks in the world. What are some of the challenges that you see as you scale out a network like that? Well, job number one for us is reliability. The customers who home their online services on things like Microsoft Azure depend on us for all the traffic flowing through their services. So we have to build networks that are fully redundant. Our software has to maintain those networks running at high quality, and they have to be really big. As you mentioned, Microsoft runs one of the largest clouds. That means that scaling up, being able to continuously add capacity to our network, even while we're in full production, is a critically important thing. Another thing we worry about is power and cost. We have to make sure, make sure that as our networks get bigger and bigger, they actually leave enough power for the servers in our data centers and aren't consuming too much of that footprint. We also, of course, worry about cost because the premise of the cloud is that we can build a very large shared cost optimized infrastructure, which then we can virtualize so that each of our customers can have exactly the private data center, the private virtual networks that they want to see at low cost. So as we see this continued network growth, uh, we see silicon and, and optics as being critical technology components uh, in these infrastructures. 
How does this influence how Microsoft thinks about their network as you move from 100 gig to 400 gig and beyond? Okay, great question. Again, we continue to see ourselves uh, adopting new technology as soon as it becomes available. We're working with the industry to actually make sure that the technologies we need to improve the data centers become available. Types of things that we worry about there is making sure that we can collect all of the components of our system into a single well-managed network. Part of that, make sure that we have technologies like 400G, uh, 400ZR optics available at low cost and high quality. And then we can manage them using the same software. In our case, that's Sonic. We're looking to take the software for open networking in the cloud and deploy it across all of our systems from our smallest uh, single ASIC pizza box router to the various largest chassis and wide area network devices that we use. And that includes all of our optical line systems as well. Microsoft's definitely leading the industry when you look at open systems and things like Sonic. What are some of the values of Sonic when you look at, at how we're partnering on Azure? Well, so Sonic's been a critical technology for us at getting high quality and reliability out of our network. What we found is that by being able to run a single open sourced network operating system on all of our switches, we get uh, battle hardened, battle tested code that uh, we know is working across all these roles. The more customers begin using Sonic, the more testing that software gets and the more availability everyone using it in the network can receive. It also makes it easiest for us to roll out new features and capabilities and tie our network devices directly into our network management uh, platforms so that we can manage our network devices the same way we manage our servers. As usual, thanks a lot for the time. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks a lot, Dave. Thanks again for having me. Hey, Rob, uh, thanks very much for joining today. Really happy that you're able to join us for this session. And we wanted to just get your thoughts on a few things. Uh, so starting out as a network provider, what are some of the important business objectives that you have in creating the future? Yeah, and, and thanks, Bill. I, um, you know, at Lumen, you know, we're really energized around furthering human progress through technology. I mean, we we want to be an enabler. We want to provide a platform that opens up innovation and creativity for our customers. Uh, we want to offer that full solution so the customers can focus less on um, you know, how to put together all the network components and really focus more on their innovation and the amazing things that they can do. Um, you know, for Lumen, it's, it's really about establishing this uh, hybrid cloud, in, embed it with security and dynamic networking, uh, and then provide it all really in this digital experience that allow our customers to interact with it and, and control it how they like. Great. Great. So what are, what are some of the challenges you uh, you have to deal with as a network provider in delivering on that vision? Yeah, our, our objective is to provide five milliseconds connectivity into that platform for our customers. So it, it will be distributed. You know, the good news is that we have a pretty extensive fiber and network footprint to achieve that, that level of, of performance. Now, providing consistent features and capabilities across that full footprint is a little more challenging <laughs> given the different generations of, of kit that we have deployed, different ecosystems that interact with them. Um, you know, that's, that's complexity that uh, we, we can't transfer on or, and make transparent to our customers in this digital experience. You know, it needs to be a, a simple and consistent offering. Uh, you know, our customers interact with it the, the same way wherever they're located, wherever they need it. So yeah, as a network guy, that can be challenging to create that consistent experience and, and make it and make it manageable for for operations. Um, scale of these networks continues to be a challenge. Uh, scale presents itself in in different ways in different segments of the network, uh, but growth of the the internet has continued to impress me, and I don't anticipate seeing that slow down uh, with so much focus that we have on you know closing this digital divide over the top services, 5G, others. Um, and, and we've been ready for 400 gig for actually quite some time. Uh, and as we get that rolled out, uh, we will still have some very large link bundles even with 400 gig. But, but it really, it tends to be the, the logical scale that's more challenging. And you know, we can put together large physical networks and make that work generally, uh, even if it's not ideal. Uh, but the constraints and things like uh, logical con customer interfaces, um, instances, memory for routing and forwarding, uh, performance data. Those have been the 
the probably the more common and and the more difficult obstacles to, to overcome. Great. And as you think about overcoming some of those obstacles, how do you think about converging IP and optical as perhaps a uh, a way that can help simplify things in your network? You know, we we tend to think that flat is better. Uh, it's not better in all cases, but but yes, layers imply transitions imply cost imply complexity so if we can collapse those layers there's there's definitely some value to be gained we've been preparing for this ip optical convergence for many years uh, and there have been some opportunities that we've taken advantage of but they haven't really been these consequential consequential shifts in architecture and and even some of the value that they bring can be offset by operational complexity or or other factors. You know, while we're still early, there's some real potential in some of the open optics work being done, you know, specifically for 400 gig right now. Uh, for IP traffic across our backbone, optical gear really still dominates the cost equation. So these developments around open optics, they're really intriguing if it can, you know, radically change that cost structure, which we think it may. You know, so you'll have fewer network transitions, fewer points of failure, You'll have the economic benefits, uh, and, and those things I think are, are mostly given. Uh, how we effectively manage such a network is still an open question, I think. Uh, but if we can solve that, and, and I suspect we will, uh, this could be a real inflection point in the path to convergence. Great. Well, we certainly share your view on that. Rob, thanks very much for joining us. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Appreciate it. Jorn, thanks so much for being here with us today. Um, just a few questions we have we'd like your thoughts on. So as a network provider, what are some of the important business objectives you have in creating the future? Uh, yeah, first of all, Bill, thank you for, for having me. It's always fun to talk about these things. So I think the business objective have been largely influenced by the last year, this massive pandemic, which basically changed the life of our customers. Therefore, much more than ever before, connectivity has become a basic need. Even more, it's a question of survival because people don't have a job if they are not connected here in the Philippines. So it's not only a question of survival for our people, but also for the economy, because if people have no job, the connectivity, uh, the economy will be influenced. Now, most important for customers, whether consumer or enterprises, is actually reliability. They want to be sure regardless at what time of day they access their service. It is always of the same kind of performance. So reliability comes before speed. And, and that's something I think we have to put more focus on. And uh, for enterprise customers, I can only say the move to the cloud has accelerated, uh, I think, by an order of magnitude. Everything is moving online. That's the only thing, uh, the only way to survive for many SMEs. SD1 is going through the roof. Uh, and also the, the need for, for security related to all this online stuff, right? And 5G comes just at the right point in time because it gives us more capabilities to connect people at higher performance and, and more speed. Great. So as you think about some of those objectives, what are some of the challenges you face as it relates to the network? You know, we we were discussing this over, over the last years, also with you guys, you know that. Uh, and uh, I think we had to overcome a number of paradigms. When we started to do data, we were coming from a voice-centric network. And congestion in a voice-centric network is part of the architecture. You can accept that in the busy hour, you get a busy tone, you dial again. But in the world where data, the access to data to the internet has become a question of survival almost, a basic need. Uh, you know, congestion is not something we can accept anymore. So customers really want us to give them something which they can rely on. Therefore, we, as a number one target, set ourselves the idea of a congestion-free network, which needs a different architecture than we had built before. Then for us, it was very important to move to a highly resilient, highly scalable architecture. And it is not enough to just build a network. We have to look to what services we are uh, running there end to end. So the network in a way needs to be service aware or service optimized. And in, just in the last year, the, the new challenge which came about was 
the flexibility to move capacity around. Because when the pandemic started and the lockdown came, 30-40% of people moved out of the CBDs into the provinces or into the suburban areas and started work from there. So while overall the data grew maybe by 30-40% in that time, in those areas we had three to four to five times more data. So the need to shift capacity has become uh, also a very critical capability. So it needs to be part of the architecture and not just a problem to be solved going forward, because I don't think the world will come back to the old style. It, people will stay online and they will work, want to work from home when they want, and they will go back to the CBDs when they want. So we need to be flexible in, in our ability to reply. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, what are some of your thoughts on, on compelling reasons to try to converge IP and optical? So I think when it comes to, you know, building networks, congestion free, highly resilient, highly scalable, simplification is, is simplification is key. It is critical to cope with the increasing scale and also the increasing innovation speed we are facing. So technologies which help us to achieve that, like converging IP and optical, which is, in my opinion, is a no brainer, right? It was, uh, you know, a, a concept since long and now we are there. Also these, these, the, the thing you guys are doing, this pluggable DWDM optics, uh, which provide an enormous uh, flexibility and, and cost benefits, will help us to create simpler architectures, which are easier to maintain and also easier to automate. And then we can also apply algorithms which help us to move from a reactive maintenance into a predictive big data based uh, maintenance, which can help us to you know, become more resilient and reliable. Jorn, thank you so much. That's some really, really good insights for us. And I think you share some of the same objectives and challenges as many of your peers around the world. Thank you, Bill. Pleasure always. A huge thank you to our phenomenal customers for joining the session, as well as both Kevin and Bill. As you can tell, we could not be more excited about the future of networking with routed optical networks. In fact, we have two additional tech innovation sessions if you'd like to learn more about this. Thank you all and have a great day. It's called the digital divide. A gap between those that have access to the internet and those that don't. And with technology advancing at blinding speeds, so too grows the gap, wider and wider. And in rural America, this gap separates more than 30 million homes and businesses from high-speed broadband service. Here, where I live, my internet has to keep up with me. And for me, it's a lifeline. Fortunately, between those who have and those who don't, there's a bridge built on a network foundation designed to deliver the fastest speeds, the most accurate connectivity, and the promise of 5G. A bridge capable of connecting every sensor, IoT device, and screen, every school and every street, everywhere, every time, and with the speed, bandwidth, reliability, and security deserving of everyone. A bridge simpler to operate, faster to deploy, able to adapt in real time, to better connect those in need with those who provide, those who make with those who buy, those who teach with those who learn. And one company is at the heart of it all, a company of builders dedicated to a world of connection between one and all. Cisco, the bridge to possible. Another great session there hosted by Jonathan Davidson. Bridging that digital divide is a key challenge for our industry and the technical innovations that we are bringing will help our service provider partners do just that. Thank you also to the speakers from Lumen, Smart and Azure who joined us in that last session. It's great to hear how these guys are reimagining the internet for the future to help bridge that digital divide and unleash the power of the internet. I particularly like what Joachim said from Smart, uh, connectivity has become a question of survival. Powerful stuff. Now, Albert, what are we hearing on Twitter? 
so many great messages um we've heard from matt saunders you know he says having grown with poor internet access i know how important it is if we have the power to help others to get access to it shaping an inclusive future for all that's beautiful Thank you, Matt, for sharing that. And we've also heard from Jerome. As the father of a daughter with a disability, I really like the idea of not leaving anyone out. And technology can be a great help in this regard. Thank you, Chuck. So thank you very much to um, Matt and, and Jerome for, for sharing that. Um, a shout out to Ben, who is watching from Switzerland for the first time. Hey, Ben. I also really loved Jonathan's throwback to the donut wall in Barcelona. Very tempting. So please do keep your um, tweets and messages coming. Use hashtag Cisco Live and don't forget to tag us. So now let's watch a little bit about how Telenor, a leading telecommunications company, have upgraded more than 200 meeting rooms, offices and home locations with Cisco's collaboration devices to improve their employee experience and productivity. Let's take a look. I've heard many of my colleagues say that Telenor is a bit like a family and we are dependent upon each other in our work. We have many global teams and we need to be able to meet and work virtually when we cannot meet physically. Telenor Group is a leading telecommunications company across the Nordics and Asia. With 180 million customers and annual sales of around 12 billion US dollars. Telenor has upgraded more than 200 meeting rooms and offices as well as home locations with Cisco's intelligent collaboration devices. Flexibility is a key to improved employee experience and productivity. We have been able to do things we couldn't even dream about before. And a big learning has been the importance of high quality video in online meetings. Additionally, we draw synergies from our own business unit called Telenor Integrated Services. And this unit is a Cisco Gold partner providing top level advisory on Cisco technology to customers. We wanted a partner who understands people as much as they understand technology a partner that we could learn from and that was also willing to learn from us. And we found that partner in Cisco. Really interesting to hear how Telenor has been leveraging our technology. In this digital age, Applications are the business, so it's critical to ensure application experience remains a competitive differentiator. To do that, your tools need the right, uh, your teams need the right tools. So let's check out this short video on App Dynamics and Thousand Eyes. Ah, the good old days. Back when all of our critical apps and services ran in the data center, everything was in one place. Easier to monitor, easier to troubleshoot. IT had more control over the app stack, network, and infrastructure. There wasn't so much finger pointing or war rooms full of people trying to figure out what to fix first. Fast forward to today, and almost any company can spin up a killer app in almost no time, and the barriers to scale are insanely low. But in our new internet-centric, hybrid, multi-cloud, serverless, distributed, disaggregated, discombobulated world, when something goes wrong, just getting to a root cause can feel like looking for a needle in a needle stack, especially when you're dependent on environments you don't own. What if it didn't have to be that way? What if you could see everything that impacts your digital supply chain, from the code to the infrastructure to the network and everything in between, and wow your customers and employees with insanely fast, proactive responses? What if your teams could be truly collaborative, even outside their comfort zones? Moving gracefully between application and network data to fix what matters. With App Dynamics plus Thousand Eyes from Cisco, you can do all that and more. You can finally get your IT ops, net ops, and app ops playing from the same playbook and get full visibility into every facet of your customer's digital experience, no matter how complex, distributed, or unpredictable your environments might be. You can see more, do more, and stay ahead of issues before they affect your users. That's the power of thinking beyond siloed monitoring tools. 
That's the power of full stack business observability. That's the power of App Dynamics plus Thousand Eyes from Cisco. Stay tuned for the blockbuster hit of Cisco Live. Coming soon. Accelerating the future of work. So as we have seen from the videos, the future of work is a really exciting topic with great opportunities. While many of us are working from home right now, we've obviously been thinking about our transition back to the office. I'm really excited to shortly introduce our next speaker, Mike Walsh. Mike is a futurist and he's going to provide an insight into the organizations and leaders that are really successfully navigating this period of change. So let's hear a bit more from Mike about his insights um, in the next inspiring uh, session starting soon called New Rules for a New World. I hope you find it really valuable and thought provoking. Over to you, Mike. Hi, it's a great pleasure to be speaking to you today at Cisco Live, although I do need to be honest with you about something. 2020 was not a great year to be a futurist. Probably wouldn't have been a great year to have been a psychic or a fortune teller either. You know what, I get asked all the time, how is it that you failed to see COVID-19 coming? And it's true, I completely missed the coronavirus. And yet, in many ways, I don't think that was my real mistake. My real mistake was underestimating the capacity of some external event like COVID-19, having the potential to not only change the world, but essentially to bring the world of 2030 forward a decade to today. And that is exactly the unusual position we now find ourselves in. Although arguably it isn't the first time we've seen a civilization scale event like this. Go back a hundred years to the Spanish flu of 1918. And what is fascinating is not just the striking similarities with today in terms of masks and quarantine and social distancing, but really the extraordinary social, political, economic, and cultural changes that were also unleashed by that virus. I'll give you a simple example. Take the position of women. So many men had fallen sick from the virus or had died in the war that women during this period were forced to take increasing positions of responsibility and authority. This, more than anything else, set the stage for the universal right to vote some years later. There were similar big changes in technology. Take a look at this ad from the New York Telephone Company uh, advocating the benefits of this disruptive new technology known as the telephone, perfect for staying in touch with friends or colleagues that might be trapped in quarantine. Now, you'd be tempted for thinking this ad came out in 1918. It actually came out a good years earlier in 1910 at the height of an earlier cholera outbreak. You see, by 1918, so many of the human operators working in switchboards had fallen sick from the virus that telephone companies were begging their customers not to use their telephones for fear they might in fact overwhelm the network. It's a timely reminder that then, as now, that even in a time of accelerating technologies, when it really comes to transformation, it's still human beings that really count. And I have no doubt that similarly, as we now move into this time of rapid change, we are also fast moving into a completely new world, a world that also runs on very different rules. That is what I want to talk to you about today. I've got three new rules I want to present to you. And here is the first. I believe that there is no longer any such thing as digital disruption, just digital delivery. Let me explain. Digital disruption. I feel like we've been talking about this for years, and I'm sure by now you know all the cliches. You had Airbnb disrupting the travel and hotel business. You had Uber disrupting the taxi and transportation business. It was like there was something special about these types of companies, as if they alone were given permission to think outside the box, to innovate, to disrupt, to do things differently. Well, if the last 18 months has made anything clear, it's simply this. We are all disruptors now. If you haven't figured out a way in this time of a pandemic to leverage automation, to leverage artificial intelligence, to work remotely, then if you haven't figured out how to truly become a digital business, well, you're probably no longer in business. 
When I say digital disruption doesn't exist, what I mean is it's no longer important in the way that it's become table stakes. It's become the price of doing business. It's just part of getting things done. What we really talk about now is digital delivery. It's just the part and parcel of 21st century business. If you want to get to the heart of what's really going to drive transformation in the next five to 10 years, then you've got to think bigger. You've got to think bolder. You've got to come up with really an answer to a more interesting question. I mean, take grocery. In the first six weeks of the pandemic, suddenly every supermarket realized they would have to pivot to delivering to customers at home, which required not only a whole new plan for logistics, but in many cases, a completely new technology stack. But there is a big difference between being a grocer that can now work on digital channels and being, say, an Ocado, a $17 billion business, which is not just an online grocer, but essentially a technology platform that provides solutions for groceries across the world. You see behind me one of Ocado's hives. This is a constellation of robots which move at the pace of six meters per second. They can take a 50 item grocery order and pack it in the moment of minutes. There is a big difference between just operating on digital channels with leveraging digital technology and investing in data to really finding out how to become an AI powered organization. Ultimately, we are now asked to answer a very difficult question, which is what is now possible in an age of AI that was simply not possible before? To answer that question, I think we need to get to the heart of three core principles. Number one, we have to figure out how we can now reinvent the way we deliver value. Tesla for me is an interesting example. I mean, what is behind Tesla's extraordinary run up in its stock price? Is it its ability to design beautiful cars? Is it its mastery of EV battery technology? Is it its founders unfortunate habit of sending out provocative tweets on Twitter? Well, probably none of these things and probably more to do with the circuits that you see behind me. This is the Tesla autopilot. It's proof that Tesla doesn't design cars. It designs computational stacks on wheels. Now, as you can see from this video, when Tesla does a software update, uh, it is really a thing of beauty. What distinguishes one high priced Tesla from maybe a cheaper one is often nothing to do with its hardware, its leather, its fit outs or accessories. It's all software. Tesla's figured out how to increase and deliver value at zero marginal cost. It's all code. And the ability to transform a very traditional industry such as automotive and change the way its supply chain operates to being something that's completely based around digital and data is really the hallmark of a 21st century disruptive organization. But the second principle for me is that it's not just enough to digitalize. We also have to ask ourselves, how do we now virtualize? Part of the traditional digital transformation model is finding ways to digitize your processes end to end. But a much bigger opportunity is to ask yourself, well, how do we now look at those assets and resources and processes in a completely new way? Very interesting company is uh, this company called Buildots from Israel. So what they started doing was the putting cameras on the construction helmets of, of workers working on a site so they could start to build a real time digital twin of a building as it was in progress. Now McKinsey estimates that site mismanagement costs anywhere between 1.5 to 1.6 trillion dollars every single year. But what if rather than sort of relying on traditional conveyancing methods and site management to work out where a building was, you could have a real time digital view of that building. It would not only change the way you manage a project, it potentially would change the way you finance and manage risk as well. That is an example of virtualizing an asset rather than simply digitalizing a 20th century one. The third principle for me is your real goal as a leader in the technology community is to build for insight not just infrastructure. You know, it's fascinating when you look at an organization like Uber Eats because they've been able to not only build a very efficient technology stack to run the business, it's all geared with building more and more insight. So they have so much information, not only on the efficiency of their deliveries and how people are interacting with the channel, 
they can actually start to build a picture of the kinds of foods that people want and use that to actually seed restaurants that don't even exist. So in recent years, Uber has actually launched over 7,000 completely virtual restaurants, essentially by just looking at the pattern of searches and working and pitching the idea of restaurants to chains to actually fill gaps in needs that they can see through their data. And this is really building towards a future where we're gonna have ghost kitchens that essentially supply restaurant brands that don't even exist in a bricks and mortar sense. So for me, it's really about thinking about the end point of what do you get when you now have more data, more computation, more learning algorithms. It isn't just more efficiency and more speed. More is different. At some point, you can have entirely new types of organizations, new types of platforms, new types of businesses. And finding that approach allows us to really think about what's possible in this new world. The pandemic has accelerated the digital reinvention of the world. This new era of AI-powered AI competition will reshape industries and organizations forever. So reinvent how you deliver value, virtualize your assets and processes, and build your infrastructure for insight. I want to give you a next action to consider as well. Constantly challenge your own assumptions about the future. Ask yourself, what are you missing? What can you learn from the youngest members of your team? Can you better incorporate their frame of reference and their experiences into your own ideas and plans for transformation? I also want to give you a mind grenade. It's like a challenge question you can think about later. What are three things that you thought were impossible that were in fact proved possible by the most recent pandemic? Rule number two, there is no such thing as remote work, just work. So remote work's been something we've been talking about a lot lately. and. In many ways, I think the novelty has started to wear off because while at first we were sort of entranced by the idea of not being in an office and we focused on the technology issues, suddenly we realized that the hardest part of remote work was not the technology at all. It was family interruptions. It was the cultural challenges of getting people to work effectively when they were in fact used to working together. And in fact, this is really a core insight because it's often easy to try to focus on upgrading technology, but technology just changes in a sense the hardware of your organization. If you really want to change, you've got to figure out how to make culture your operating system. And this is not easy because it's often the hardest thing when you have a new disruptive technology to figure out how it changes the way that people in an organization make decisions, the way they do things, the, the way they get things done. If you look at sort of the history of disruptive tech, you know, long before AI, mobile phones, social media, probably the most disruptive technology was in fact electricity. And electricity had its iPod moment, if you like, in 1831 when the British scientist Michael Faraday invented the electric dynamo. Now this should have been the moment which unleashed a wave of transformation in industry. But actually it took a little bit longer than people expected. Five years? 10 years, 20 years, 50 years. It actually took almost 82 years before someone came along, in this case, Henry Ford, and said, so this electricity idea, this probably means we can not only power factories in a different way, we can design them in a different way as well. This was the origins of his idea of the moving assembly line, which was an early form of automation. But essentially, what happened was in the early 1900s, they'd just go to a factory, they'd take out a steam engine out, and they'd put an electric engine in. But they'd leave the whole infrastructure that had been there since the early Industrial Revolution. It took almost 100 years for someone to say, do you know what, this can fundamentally change the way we operate. We're not going to have 100 years this time. So if we can't very quickly figure out how AI, automation, algorithms, better security, how all of these things transform the way we do things, then we're in serious trouble. When I think about 21st century organizations, it's not the where we're, that's changing, it's the how. And in particular, I think there are five attributes or values that will characterize modern business. And they are mobility, autonomy, memory, objectivity, and velocity. So let's talk about these. M mobility. Does it really matter where you are if you're trying to get something done? Now, you might think this question has been absolutely answered in the last 18 months, but I think we're just at the beginning of this journey. 
And the reason for that is that in many ways, remote work technology is nothing new. I mean, we've had prototype video phones since the 60s. But what's really changed, I think, is the bigger cultural question of how we create distributed organizations that allow decision making to happen anywhere. Think about it. When we start to move back to a more hybrid office, will it matter whether you're working from home or whether you're sitting in the boardroom? If it does matter, then you haven't really solved the mobility challenge because it's not the bandwidth or the VPN or the collaboration platform that matters. It's the way you set up influence and decision making and authority that really gives you your powers of mobility. The second characteristic, I think, is autonomy, which is ultimately the ability of your teams to make decisions without central control. It's a defining characteristic, I think, of success. A little while ago, I had the opportunity to interview Harit Tawa, who's the uh, head of the consumer division at Goldman Sachs that launched Marcus. Now, you'd remember Marcus. It's one of the world's most successful digital banks. And I was fascinated because this was a startup that was essentially born in a 150-year-old, very traditional, very conservative investment bank, Goldman Sachs. And initially, I thought that Marcus' success all came down to its ability to pair a fantastic business model with great technology. But Harid actually said, Mike, please don't call us a technology company. We're a customer solutions business. He said a big part of our success is actually our organizational structure. Everyone at Marcus is, organized, is also part of these consumer facing pods. They're like agile teams who are highly autonomous. They have the ability to focus on a consumer issue and they've got the authority to solve it. And he says that ability for people to be part of those agile teams, regardless of their functional role, has really been core to the success of that business directly answering customer needs. The third characteristic for me is memory. We often talk about the power of being learning organizations, but what does that really mean? So when the pandemic first hit, I spent quite a bit of time researching companies that actually never had offices. They were designed to be remote from the beginning. One such company is Zapier, software automation firm. I interviewed their CEO and founder, Wade Foster, who told me that one of the smartest things they learned early on was the importance of recording their key decisions. So whenever a key decision gets made, they record not only the outcome, but the thinking behind it and any data they used. This is fantastic when you're trying to bring new team members up to speed on the culture of your decision making. But it also allows new people to actually challenge decisions as well by looking at the underlying assumptions and whether they've changed. The fourth characteristic for me is objectivity, which really is the ability for anyone in the company to use facts and data to challenge even established ideas. This to me has been one of the reasons why Amazon has been so successful. It isn't because they've built fantastic infrastructure or their massive investments in logistics. It's because they have been very focused on creating a data driven culture. A great example for me, for me, for this is the fact that at Amazon, they have banned PowerPoint. Now, I don't know what you think about this. I think this is a great idea. I mean, think about all of the hours, the weeks, maybe the years of your life you've wasted in endless PowerPoint presentations. It isn't that PowerPoint is bad, but rather that Jeff Bezos believes that if you're going to get a decision made, it's better that people come in rather than with a, a big presentation with a highly structured, carefully thought out six page memo that someone's put a lot of care and thought into, into creating and curating. And the idea being that if you clearly identify a hypothesis, what's in it for the customer, and you have data to support up your argument, you're gonna have a much higher quality discussion around the decision that actually needs to get made. The fifth and probably most important characteristic for me is velocity, or the speed at which teams can respond to situations. In the early days of the pandemic, I spoke to Sandeep Dadlani, who's the Chief Digital Officer at Mars. And I said to him, what have you learned from the crisis? And he said, it's, it's been extraordinary. He said, everything that my digital transformation team has been working on for the last few years, essentially came into being in the first six weeks of the crisis. He said, I'll give you a simple example. He said, our logistics team was full of people who had these incredible familial relationships, but suddenly, you know, when the pandemic hit, 
they couldn't operate the way they used to. People were now working from home. So rather than in the old days of picking up the phone and calling someone you knew who was working on the factory floor, who'd then look out the window and say to the truck driver, listen, can you hold up? We need to load up some more pallets. People now had to rely on digital systems and they became more data driven and they became more objective. And they started asking more piercing probing questions about the sources of demand and supply. And all of this essentially sped things up. Sandeep said it was like they found out a way to improve their internal clock speed. And believe me, once you've done that, there is no going back. So these five forces for me are really the core of what a 21st century organization looks like. It's why remote work is just the beginning of a much bigger revolution that is changing the nature of business itself. So as you start to think about a next action on this point, Create a discussion channel on your collaboration platform. Use WebEx Teams to create a hashtag transformation topic and share stories about things that are not only going on in your organization, but in other organizations or in other industries. And as a mind grenade, here's how I would challenge you. If you had the opportunity to redesign your infrastructure today for the post pandemic world with no legacy systems and all the lessons of the last 12 months, what would you do differently? Rule number three, AI will not destroy jobs, but it will change them. We're going to see increasing uncertainty in the next few years about the role of automation and employment. People are going to be worried, but should they? Interestingly, if you look at history in the early days of automation in the American Industrial Revolution, when they first brought automation, say, to the cotton industry, you can imagine the weavers were upset. Literally, here was their livelihood under threat. But in many cases, they didn't lose their jobs. Their jobs changed because rather than doing the physical weaving, they now had to maintain the machines that did the work for them. But as a result, the cost of cloth began to fall. People started to buy more cloth. And in fact, the number of people employed in this industry at the height of the Industrial Revolution in America between 1830 and 1900 didn't go down. It quadrupled. Something very similar happened uh, in the financial services industry in the late 60s, early 70s, when they brought in ATMs. Yeah, OK, you didn't now need as many bank tellers in a bank branch, but this meant it was cheaper to open up bank branches. So banks did just that. They opened up many more branches in many more places. Interestingly, there are actually more bank tellers today working in financial services than there were before the ATM. But that's not the point. You see, you need a different kind of person with a very different set of skills. And that is really, I think, the core of the issue. How do jobs now need to change in a world where we increasingly have more automation, more data, more technology? And in particular, how do leadership jobs need to change? You see, I think we need to become new types of leaders. I think we need to become algorithmic leaders who can combine a deep understanding of human complexity with a flair for computational thinking. In a way, we need a new set of leadership principles to guide us. And that is really where I want to leave you with today, with three principles. Number one, or when you automate, think about how you can elevate. So Shell is an interesting case study. In, they're facing an increasingly decarbonized energy future, one that's going to require probably more knowledge of AI, machine learning, data analytics, in order to run increasingly complex and adaptive energy grids. So interestingly, Shell realized they have lots of geotechnical engineers or people that have got incredible math skills. So these people, they're now trying to migrate by giving them more and more uh, lessons and, and materials on artificial intelligence and machine learning and data. So in order to transition their workforce by identifying the capabilities they already have, so when you automate, think about how you can elevate the talent and capabilities in your team and organization. The second principle for me is learn how to better embrace uncertainty and in fact, to anticipate and design in failure. So the F-35 fighter jet has been one of the most expensive and problematic fighter planes in history. It cost a fortune to build and it's not really working as planned. And interestingly, one of the biggest problems is the maintenance software. The maintenance software essentially is requiring engineers to log 10,000 hours of data that should be, be collected autonomously. And this means that in many cases, the planes are not flying when they in fact should be fit to fly. 
So when the Department of Defense commissioned a report on this, the Atlantic Council actually recommended that the DoD spend more time looking at companies like Netflix and Amazon. You see, at Netflix, they've got something called the Simeon Army of chaos monkeys that they deliberately unleash onto their systems to basically unleash uncertainty and ambiguity. They actually build failure into the systems in order to test and to track things that are likely to happen. And by doing this, they make their systems more resilient and more robust. Similarly at Amazon, when they specify problems, they have a specific language in which rather than just uh, trying to identify what has to, um, what could possibly go wrong, they actually identify what has to go right in order for the system to function. So by anticipating failure, by embracing uncertainty, they build a more robust platform. The third principle for me is probably the most important, which is if the answer is X, learn how to ask Y. There is no doubt that we're moving into a time with increasing risks of not just cyber attacks and data breaches, but algorithmic bias and AIs that are potentially discriminatory. And there's no point waiting around to see who's at fault when this is exactly the moment when we have to develop and nurture the right moral compass. This applies both to engineers and programmers as well to business leaders, because now is the time that we have to really think, what are we building these systems for? What data are we using? Is the data underlying bias? What are we optimizing these platforms around? These are deep and in fact moral questions that are essential not only for designing equitable platforms, but ensuring that we bring our humanity as leaders to the table. So what I'm really saying is, as we look to the 21st century, we're gonna need a whole new playbook of leadership principles. I've given you three principles today. I've actually got another seven. If you're interested in learning more, please take a moment to check out my book, The Algorithmic Leader. I believe leaders are more important than ever, but we have to evolve and adapt. When we automate, we have to elevate our teams. We need to prepare for failure and embrace uncertainty. And most importantly, we need to be ready to challenge the future with a strong moral compass. As a next action, ask yourself, what can you do as a leader to better drive digital transformation? Write a personal transformation plan for areas of change, either technological or cultural, that you can influence in your role. And as a final mind grenade, I'd say this. What are the behaviors and beliefs that made you successful in the past that, if you continued in the future, would in fact undermine your progress? So I hope you found this interesting. It's been a great pleasure talking to you today at Cisco Live, and I'd, and I'd love to stay in touch. So please take a moment to follow me on Twitter or on Instagram. And if you'd like the summary slides from today, you can find them at mike-walsh.com slash go. Right up front, I challenged you about what's really at stake here. It's so much more interesting than just a period of recovery from an incredible global crisis. We are truly at the dawn of a new world, a world that's gonna run on very new rules. So what's gonna happen as we accelerate out of this crisis? Is it gonna be a new renaissance or a new boom? Well, I hope so. But ultimately, it'll be up to us and the decisions we make now. Because now is the time for us to rethink how we engage our customers and our communities. Now is the time for us to redesign where and how we work. And now is the time for us to reimagine our role as leaders, because now, more than ever, is truly a time for transformation. Wow, I really loved that concept of mind grenade that Mike shared. You know, what did you think was impossible before the pandemic, but that is now possible? So for me, I mean, I never thought I'd be able to work from home five days a week and also the amount of times I'd say you're on mute. Um, but look, technology has made it easy and possible. So do tweet us and let us know your thoughts as well. David, what's coming up next for us? Yeah, well, next we have one of our musical guests, Alba. What a massive start to Cisco Live 2021. We're excited to be underway with the program and we're even more excited to be introducing two very special performances for you. Both of these artists are joining us from 